Today's Ask Amy podcast is all about cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin. So joining me today is the author of Bitcoin for Beginners, Clayton Rawlings. Thanks for coming in today because I am definitely a beginner. I need a Bitcoin for dummies. Amy, thank you for having me. So tell me how you first, your personal injury attorney, but then so why and how did you become interested in Bitcoin? My uh, oldest son owns a barber shop in Santa Monica, California, and being in Santa Monica, the majority of his clients are tech individuals, uh, high net worth people, and they uh, went to him back in 2016 and wanted to pay him in Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, they opened a wallet on his phone, on his smartphone, and then they would transfer. And at that time, Bitcoin was worth $300. Uh -huh. So he had $300 worth of Bitcoin on his phone. He suggested I get in it. Nobody takes it. Financial advice from their children. Right. So <laughs> I immediately rejected that as out of hand. Then he called me a year later in 2017, and he said, hey, that $300 in Bitcoin is now worth $3,000. Well, now he had my attention. Yeah. You're like, I don't have any other investments that have done that well. No, yeah. never. And so I, uh, I've got a friend who owns a tech company. So I had him over, and I said, I want to understand this. I need a deep dive. So he brought some computer engineers in, and uh, over the course of an evening, they walked me through it step by step so I could have a fundamental understanding of what this is. And then, you know, from that moment forward, I was hooked and I got into it. And when you say got into it, you mean you you buy it and hold it? You Do you buy things with it? Like, what do you do with it? I All those things. Okay. And the uh, uh, it's like I paid uh, my barber mm -hmm. with Ethereum because I did for him what somebody had done for my son. The, uh, and showed him how to navigate that. And he realm. didn't say, no, I don't want this. I want cash. <laughs> <laughs> he actually got very excited because okay. he'd heard things about it. But uh, the thing with Bitcoin, or before we get into that, full disclosure, uh, yes, I own Bitcoin. I'm also a seed investor in a tech startup called okay. Airwire, which is a altcoin platform. And my wife has stock in Coinbase, mm -hmm. just a couple thousand dollars. Uh, but uh, that's the extent of it. But what I want people to understand is if you buy Bitcoin, you've dropped two drops of water in an ocean. You've not helped me at all. Mm -hmm. If you refrain from buying Bitcoin, well, then you refrain from dropping two drops of water in an ocean. You have not hurt me at all. So I absolutely want to explain this so that people that have an interest can actually approach this with a fundamental understanding. But, you know, people have to make their own decisions about their their own money. And but I want to make sure everybody understands I'm not here to give financial advice. This is for educational purposes only. No, and I appreciate the full disclosure of, of any possible what some may see as a conflict of interest. And you're just explaining this is my, the extent of it, which really isn't much. How do I buy it? Where do I go? And then how do I know that that's mine? Because these aren't dollars and coins and pennies that we can count and collect and tangibly hold. It's not a physical thing. It's code. When you buy Bitcoin, you're buying code. You know, it's called a coin, but that's an analogy. It's yeah. a misnomer. It's not a physical coin. Like a nickel's a coin, right? Bitcoin is encrypted code, and that's what you acquire. And as it becomes more prolific throughout our society, supply and demand is at play, and, and it's going to force the price to lift over time. There can only be 21 million. Why? There can only be 21 million Bitcoin. I've heard this. Why? Why okay. can't we just create more code? Because the, the Bitcoin itself, that platform, was created with a overriding controlling code, and it is controlled by that. It defines it. That's how it exists. Where I come into stories when... when I, I do stories on cryptocurrency. It's because someone said, you know what, I'm going to invest. I'm going to buy this Bitcoin or whatever other type of cryptocurrency and they get scammed because they went someplace. It was not a legitimate like a Coinbase 
place to buy it. And they ended up basically just giving their money to somebody and they thought that they were buying Bitcoin. I don't think anybody should ever buy crypto if you're new to this off of a link that is sent to you or to go to some random website. You're just asking for trouble. It's Mm -hmm. just too easy to be taken advantage of. Uh, What I have told all my family and friends and, and all of them have done this is that got into it. They is to start at Coinbase. It's an electronic bank. It's a reputable bank and it's user friendly as user friendly as it can be uh-huh. in the crypto realm. Uh, the uh, And so that's a place to start. And most of the coins on there, they have stricter standards than most places. So you're limited to what you can buy uh, it, because they try to make sure they don't get it. But uh, they had one recently that, that went bankrupt and they did not have the assets behind the, the coins as they claim they did, and, and they went under. And that one was on Coinbase, which goes back to what I said. Stay with Bitcoin and Ethereum until you really understand. And uh-huh. then if you want to venture out, well, you know, it's exciting, but uh, it's not for the naive or, or for people that don't have a, any experience in this area. So your, so your sort of advice for people who are just getting into it, who might have some money that they can afford to buy some Bitcoin um, to experiment, your advice is buy it and hold it and see what happens to it? Yes. Well, what I told all my kids was, all right, take a position, buy your Bitcoin, Close that computer, put it up on a shelf, and hide under the bed. <laughs> and don't look at the daily price, which is hard not to do. Which is what they tell us to do with your 401k or any big, right? Right. Big account. And uh, in uh, five to ten years from now, uh, if it takes off, it's going to be a, a radical event. Uh, but it's not guaranteed to. So that's why I tell people. Do not sell your car and mortgage your house and go all in. With that volatility, you're, you you could be destroyed. And so we see it all over the place. Do you know what what the value of what Bitcoin is trading at today? Uh, yeah, a little over nineteen thousand. A little over nineteen thousand, and it's been as high as I think you said sixty two sixty five thousand. Sixty five thousand. It when I got in in uh, July of twenty seventeen, it was twenty five hundred. Well, it had been. Uh, three hundred dollars January of that year Uh and so I thought well I've missed it right but then I thought well I'm gonna try it so I bought one well by December it hit uh, 20,000 however it then crashed all the way to 3,800 over an 18 month period we call that the crypto winter Mm -hmm. Uh, that was the longest 18 months of my life Um, (laughs) but then it lifted again went into the 20s and the 30s dropped back down again into the teens. And then when it finally had that last run up, it it hit 65,000. It has now crashed to a low of 17.8 was the most recent bottom about a month ago. Since then, it's been bouncing between 19 and and 24,000. This is a good time to take a break. Um, When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about, I've heard a lot about the energy that is required. And that's sort of a, you know, a side sidebar story, but it's interesting. All the energy that's being used, creating and mining, not creating, mining for Bitcoin. Correct. Right. Okay. We'll be right back with Clayton Rawlings. Thank you so much. Okay, welcome back to the Ask Amy podcast. We are here with Clayton Rawlings talking about all things Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And you just asked me because I said, we're going to talk about blockchain, another term that I hear thrown around whenever people talk about cryptocurrency. Um, But how we got there, as I said, so I set up my account in, say, Coinbase. I go in, I make my first step and I say, I've got $100 or $200. I'm going to buy Bitcoin. However, small amount of a fraction of a Bitcoin that buys me. And then what? Like, how does anybody know or believe or accept that I have this percentage of Bitcoin? Very good question. Okay. Uh, Right now, um, Bitcoin is, uh, let's just call it 20,000 to round Mm -hmm. off, right? Make the math easy. So you've got $1,000, right? 
So for $1,000, when you convert that to Bitcoin on your Coinbase account, you will get 0.05 um, Bitcoin. Okay. Because it can go out to eight digits. You know, you don't have to buy. Every time people are talking about buying a Bitcoin, well, you know, if you've got $20,000, yeah, you can go buy a Bitcoin. However, for $1,000, you can buy a portion of a Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? It's divisible all the way out eight digits. So you, you have purchased 0.05 Bitcoin. And then the question is, how do I defend this? How do I prove I own it? How, yeah. how is it that it'll be accepted? The uh, Bitcoin functions on what's called the blockchain. And the vast majority of all cryptocurrencies also function on the blockchain. Blockchain is a generic term for the technology, mm -hmm. not the specific coins. So Bitcoin and Ethereum are both on the blockchain. The, if, if you'll excuse me reading real quick, mm -hmm. blockchain is defined as a shared distributed ledger that keeps track of transactions and assets in a network. That was a mouthful. What that means is when you create a transaction, that transaction immediately goes out over thousands of computers globally uh -huh. that are all tied into that network. Okay. And they're keeping track of an asset. In When it's Bitcoin, they're keeping track of Bitcoin. Who owns it? Who has what, right? They, they've got all the wallets on there. And so if I transfer you a Bitcoin, it would go from my wallet to your wallet. So you would now have it encrypted with a specific code. You know, thousands, tens of thousands of computers worldwide are all then hashing that uh -huh. event. They're all keeping the same record. That's how they confirm one another. And that's why it is so durable and robust. That's why it's existed going on 13 years now without going down ever. And but it's decentralized. Nobody owns it. So where are these computers? <laughs> they're all literally all over the world. They're called mining rigs. Okay. And you know, we'd mentioned that earlier, uh, which are just computers that are hashing it. And why do they do it? Because they get rewarded in Bitcoin for having done that. And so that's the economy of Bitcoin. The miners are doing it because they're going to receive Bitcoin as a, a reward for having committed all that computer power over that time period. Now, then the question is, well, when they finally create the final one, uh -huh. which is in 2040, number 21 million, when it's made, there will be no more new coins made. However, at that point, they receive fees, mining fees. So if I want to transfer a Bitcoin to you, the fee might be $18, which they'll take out of the Bitcoin. So it'll be 0. 0.000003 Satoshis goes to the uh, miner for having accomplished that task. Okay. All right. Almost as a broker, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And they're facilitating the, uh, but there's no broker, there's no human involved. It's just the code enforcing itself over the, the network. And sometimes people say, well, you know, a ledger, I mean, you know, that's just an accounting of things. Uh -huh. You know, that's trivial. Uh, that, that couldn't be more wrong. Uh, our entire civilization is defined by ledgers. You know, who owns property? Well, that's all the deed records. And, you know, that ledger is kept by the local governments. Um, you know, your grades in school, the school is keeping the ledger of all your, you know, what you've done academically. Uh, the banks have our bank accounts. Those are ledgers. It's a record. Of the, it. Yeah. The credit card companies are keeping a ledger of every purchase you've made, you know. Mm -hmm. So our ability to our cars, the car title, all, these are all ledgers. Our entire civilization is defined by ledgers. So they matter. And with the blockchain, it's cheaper and it's more reliable because they're decentralized ledgers that don't rely on people making these entries mm -hmm. and then defending the ledger, right? If a, if a bank gets hacked, you know, they can pull the money out. When you've got uh, 40,000 depositors, when you've got 40,000 crypto wallets, they would have to hack one wallet at a time. 
uh, the way I explain this so people understand how strong a decentralized network is versus a centralized network, mm -hmm. which all those networks I just – they're all centralized, you know, bank, credit card, government. Right. So – they have to protect that ledger, and so there is a choke point. There is a a play a, a point of attack mm -hmm. that will do a lot of damage. But so think in terms of a power plant, it's creating electricity for forty thousand homes. If an enemy wanted to knock out the power to forty thousand homes, all they have to do is knock out one power plant. If forty thousand homes had solar panels on their roofs. Well, then they're decentralized. They're not centralized. Right. And so now if they wanted to knock out the power to 40,000 homes, they'd have to do it 40,000 times. So it is the, more secure. Yes. You're saying. The, the, yes. The decentralization is actually harder and more durable by definition for that very reason than your centralized network. And this is one of the reasons, one of the advantages you're saying of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. I was surprised when you said it was 12 years ago. The beginning of cryptocurrency was 12 years ago. But why? I mean, how did it come about? And I thought that was interesting, too, just the history of it. Yes. Since the 90s, there's been a need for electronic currency. And it was kind of the holy grail among the computer scientists and the cryptographers. And because they needed something that was reliable because they knew the proliferation of fraud w would be massive in, in, if it wasn't done properly. Mm -hmm. And after the crash of 08 or whatever you want to call it, the savings and loan crisis, whatever, when, when everything went to hell in a handbasket um, in 08, it's not a coincidence. I'm, I'm confident that Bitcoin was released in 09 and it is – an attempted solution to the problem we have with these inflationary cycles. Mm -hmm. It's still an experiment. You know, and that's why I tell people, you know, if you want an adventure, get in it, but don't put your kids' college money in there. Don't do something reckless, right? Right. But if this works, it's, it's going to be incredible, but it's not guaranteed to work. This would be uh, possibly, if we're going into a recession, the first first recession where we've had cryptocurrency. Yeah. So it's sort of designed for something like this. So how do you think that will play out? I mean, will it, it'll benefit all those people who had the money to buy it. Correct. And that's why the early adopters, the ones with courage and sh who shouldered the risk are the ones that are going to benefit massively. Whereas the people on the sidelines, you know, they're going to come in late and, you know, for the simple reason, you know, what would you sell me a dollar for? Mm -hmm. A dollar, right? right? What would I pay for a dollar? A dollar, because a dollar's a dollar, right? With cryptocurrency, because it's not worldwide adoption yet, as it's adopted because it has a hard cap, there's massive pressure on what the actual price is going to be as it facilitates commerce. And that's why the early adopters stand to win big. Whereas if somebody comes in at the end, well, you know, they're going to pay a dollar for a dollar. And see, right now, if a home is $100,000, uh -huh. you would say, well, how many Bitcoin is that? Well, right now it would be approximately five Bitcoin. Um, but if there's mass adoption, then the home would be advertised for sale for five Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. and, for the, and so right now, if the home is $100,000 – you don't ask the realtor, well, what would that be in British pound sterling, right? right? Why would we do that, right? We don't use that currency. Well, and that's why when they say, what would that be in Bitcoin? That's because the dollar is still the go-to entity for all of us at the moment. But as cryptocurrency, or Bitcoin specifically, proliferates, um, there, we're going to see more and more of people moving crypto instead of moving dollars. So you're saying if we wait too long, then basically you've missed it's it's like when you're buying in a down market. And granted, crypto's not always down. Bitcoin's not always down. I mean it gets pretty high, but if, if you wait until it is a much more widely accepted form of payment and and uh money, I guess, then you've missed the boat. True. Yeah. When do you see that happening? <laughs> well 
I said earlier, there's no bona fide experts in cryptocurrency. And when you watch many of the self-pronounced experts make hard predictions, mm-hmm. not vague stuff, yeah. but hard predictions, they're almost always wrong. Yeah. Bitcoin has a way of humbling us all. And uh, I can assure the audience there's a lot of humility on this side of the room right now because you're asking me to probably make a fool of myself. But I'll here we go. Uh-huh. Um, I think in 10 years uh, time from now, uh, 2030, 2032, in and around that realm, uh, if it's going to happen, it should happen by then. Okay. All right. And so your biggest takeaway, I appreciate you coming in again. He wrote Bitcoin for beginners. So if we were talking too fast or all of this was still sort of over your head, I know I'm reading it. You can read the book. You can buy it on Amazon. But biggest takeaway, you think, for people listening to this who who understood about half of it? I mean, what do you think they should focus on your message? Open a an account with Coinbase, right, an electronic bank that's reputable, uh, Turn off the noise, you know, and all the things that get said on the Internet about, you know, whatever. Dedicate an amount of money that you can afford to lose and buy Bitcoin, buy Ethereum. And then if you want, continue to educate yourself within that realm. And you may want to go for some of the more exotic altcoins, right, Uh, understanding that the farther you get away from Bitcoin and Ethereum, the greater the risk. Mm-hmm. Um, but the metaverse, you know, the 3D environment that is now being created, uh, it's the people that are creating it are determined to have it run on cryptocurrency. And that's why I'm saying it is the future. And, you know, as we go into space and we have space commerce, how would we facilitate that? Well, we transfer code. And that's what cryptocurrencies, you know, they fulfill that need. Uh huh. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming in today. I hope that everyone has learned a little something about Bitcoin. I know I've learned a little something, um, maybe just enough to be dangerous. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate you for educating all of us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a great day.